Welcome back to the Black Swan Capitalist channel. My name is Vandel Algera and Versan Algera is here with me today. Today joining us is Peter Schiff. He's the Chief Marketing Strategist at Euro-Pacific Asset Management and a founding member. Peter is widely recognized as a financial analyst and has appeared frequently on Fox News, Fox Business, CNBC, CNN, and other financial and political news outlets. Peter is also the author of many best-selling books, and he achieved national notoriety in 2008 as being one of the few economists to have accurately forecast the financial crisis and housing collapse well in advance. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. I uh, really appreciate your time today. So uh, oh, sure, how are you man. doing? <clears throat> uh, thanks for having me on your show. Look forward to uh, talking with you guys. First thing I'd like to talk about is the $1.7 trillion massive and reckless spending spree. You know, we see an unholy alliance <clears throat> between the Republicans and the Democrats, and they were able to get this passed. This is going to have very serious consequences going into 2023. <clears throat> I was very much opposed to these continuing resolutions when Trump was signing onto them. Unfortunately, the Republicans had a brief window of opportunity to try to cut back on government spending, but instead they expanded it and, and, and Donald Trump bragged about it. So, uh, no, there's, there's uh, no uh, political will right now at all, nor is there any kind of push for any you know, fiscal sanity in Washington. Now, you would think with inflation now at 40-year highs and the biggest political problem out there that there might be an impetus to actually start cutting back on deficit spending, which is ultimately the source of the inflation, both the deficits that Congress creates and then the Federal Reserve cooperating by monetizing those debts, doing quantitative easing. Now, the Fed is backing away from quantitative easing now. And so that obviously is going to weigh heavily on the cost of financing these deficits to the, you know, the, the detriment of the rest of the economy. But still, I don't think the public makes the connection between the deficit spending and inflation or the backup in interest rates. But I think over the next couple of years, that may be a different story. And there may be some type of impetus to reduce spending. But for now, they keep on uh, spending money. And so the inflation problem is going to get worse. And it's not just the discretionary spending, because that's what this $1.7 billion trillion dollar spending bill was that was the discretionary spending but we have most of the spending on autopilot and it's not just on autopilot it's it's going you know up every year because all these programs automatically increase spending and a lot of them are indexed to some type of inflation rate the cpi and so we know they're going up even even more now so that's an even bigger problem than the discretionary is Social Security and, and Medicare and all these things that they don't even vote on that are just automatic. Wow. So so more spending, more inflation, more suffering across the USA, basically. Yeah, well, all of this government has to be paid for. The public has to pick up the cost of all these programs. And nobody's taxes are being raised. Mm -hmm. and, and so the public has to ask the question, well, if I'm not being taxed, where's the money coming from? How is the government spending this money? Well, they're spending it because the Federal Reserve creates it. But that doesn't mean that there's no cost, because if that was true, then let's just eliminate all taxes and just have the Fed print up all the money and everybody gets government for free. Well, there's no free lunch. And whenever the government spends newly printed money into circulation, it diminishes the value of the money that's already there. So if you have money that you saved or that you've earned and the government runs deficits and creates money and spends it, then the value of all your money goes down. And the way you see that is the price of everything you buy goes up. And we talk about that or label it inflation, but it's not inflation. The inflation was the expansion of the money supply. The result of inflation is that the price of everything went up but the difference, what you pay, the extra cost of all these goods and services amounts to a tax. So instead of paying for government spending through higher income taxes, you pay through higher inflation. It's higher prices that you end up paying. See, if the government took my money 
then I would have less money to spend, and so I would end up with less stuff. But if the government just takes my purchasing power through inflation, I have the same amount of money, but I end up buying less stuff because the stuff costs more. And so the stuff that I can no longer afford to buy, well, that's the tax. Somebody mm -hmm. else spent that money. The recipient of a government check got to buy the things that I can no longer afford because prices went up. Right. So inflation is basically taxation without representation. That's what Well, we've got representation, but it's just it's taxation without a vote, without any consequences, without the tax the taxers being held accountable or responsible. It's just stealth tax. It's a tax that people don't recognize they're paying. But it's also the most regressive of all taxes because it falls hardest on really those who can least afford it. And that is the middle class or the working poor. They just get clobbered by inflation. When you're rich, uh, the inflation tax is a nuisance at, at, at most. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the cost of living goes up, if you're if you're only spending 10 percent, let's say, or 5 percent of your income, uh, you know, and the rest of it, you're just investing. If the cost of living goes up, you don't suffer. Maybe you invest a little less. So the economy suffers because there's not as much investment capital. And so you don't have as much economic growth. You don't have as much job creation. But the wealthy people uh, who cut back on their investing to pay higher food prices or things like that, their, their standard of living doesn't decline. Um, you know, maybe their children will inherit less. I don't know, but, but, but they're, they're fine. But when you're living paycheck to paycheck, when pretty much you're spending all your money on food and energy and rent and utilities and taxes and insurance, you know, when prices go up 10, 20%, it is a big, big deal. Definitely. And, um, I see, you know, there's, you already know this probably, but a lot of the middle class and the lower income class are maxing out their credit cards. So you're seeing yeah. people running around town, doing shopping, whatever, just buying new vehicles, new clothes, luxury things they don't really need, not necessities. And they really can't afford it because of gas prices, food prices, cost of living is going up, but they're still using those credit cards to get by. Credit is still too plentiful thanks to the Fed. What people need to be doing is stop buying stuff that they can't afford. They need to tear up those credit cards and and save but they're not going to do that unless the fed raises interest rates well above the inflation rate which they're not going to do because the people who are in debt can't afford to pay and we'd have a financial crisis mm -hmm. so the fed could pretend that it's going to fight inflation but it's not actually prepared to fight it because if it did it it would have an even bigger problem on its hands at least from its perspective and that would be a complete economic collapse and financial crisis and we wouldn't be talking about whether or not we're in recession. We'd be talking about whether or not it's a recession or a depression. We could see very high inflation then. Yeah, well, we already have high inflation. We'll just see exactly. higher inflation. Um, so even though it's coming down slightly in, you know, for what they're reporting, we're still going to see that even higher in 2023. Everything ebbs and flows. And sure, you're going to have inflation picking up and then easing back. I mean, I'm talking about prices, not actual inflation, but sure. mm -hmm. especially when you're looking back year over year and you have a, a big rise. And then obviously when you look backwards, you know, you, you may find that, okay, prices are not accelerating at the same rate they were, but they're still accelerating at a rate that's well above 2%. I mean, we're not even close to that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. even if we pull back to where it's four or five or 6%, uh, who's to say a few months later, it's not 10, 11, 12%. Yeah. Because all of the inflationary policies are still intact. And I, I think that next year, the Fed's going to return to QE. I don't think they can keep up the quantitative okay. tightening for much longer. They, they tried it back in 2018, but they had to give it up by the end of the year because of the damage to the markets and the economy. Well, it's doing as much damage, if not more now, because the economy is even more over leveraged now than it was then, thanks to all the additional years of quantitative easing and 0% interest rates that allowed the economy to go even deeper into debt. And so now it's even more dependent on low interest rates and therefore an even bigger collapse when those low rates are removed.
So in other words, we're in a bubble and it just keeps getting bigger. Mm -hmm. That's yes, basically and, what's happening. Yes. And the air is coming out, but whenever it, enough of it comes out, the Fed just blows more back in. That, that's their, the way they've been operating. Well, how long can that go on for, in your opinion? Well, it's already gone on longer than I would have thought a decade ago. Uh, so we're living literally on borrowed time. The, the whole thing can implode at any moment. But I think the fact that we have had this now outburst in inflation, uh, that kind of lets you know that we're nearing the end of the line. Because the, the, the only reason the Fed was able to get away with all this was because they could claim we didn't have enough inflation. They were able to point to a CPI that was below 2%. And they said, hey, we don't even have enough inflation yet. We can print all this money. We can keep rates down because you know we're still below our target. But now that they're miles above the target, there really is no excuse to create more inflation. But that's the only tool the Fed has in its toolkit. I mean, every problem it's confronted, it's solved with inflation. Well, now that inflation itself has become the problem, they, they've got no tools. You can't solve the inflation problem by creating more inflation. So for now, central banks are going to continue to inflate. And as we're seeing right now, they're going to continue to inflate this debt market and until at some point where the printing machine stops. And that's going to have to happen, I believe, very soon. Yeah, and I mean, they're, they're trying to inflate less. They are raising rates. They are cutting back mm -hmm. on their money printing. But, you know, there's still a lot of inflation in the pipeline and their policies are still inflationary, even if they're less inflationary than they were. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just like if you're a heroin addict, and you just decide to use less heroin, you know, you're still taking heroin. But now if your body is used to a certain amount and you don't get that amount, you can still go through withdrawal symptoms, even though you're still on that drug. And I think that's where the economy is. I mean, we haven't gone off the drug. Uh, and if we don't go off it, we're, we're never going to break the habit. But I do think that once the, you know, the, the symptoms of the withdrawal get bad enough we're of course we're going to up the dose which is what we've done every time and so qe5 is coming and i remember you know when they first started qe when they did the first one i said you know they would do it again and then they did it again and i said well we'll have you know more qe's than rocky movies and so we've now had four and i'm pretty sure they had rocky five i don't know if they had six i forget but we're gonna have qe5 but what i said about qe4 even before they ended QE3, was that QE4 would be bigger than one, two, and three combined. And that's exactly what happened. And so when they do the next round of QE5, it's gonna be bigger than the first four combined because you know the effects are cumulative. The more QE you do now, the more you're gonna to have to do later when you try to stop because now all the air comes out of that bubble and it, you need a lot more of it to try to reflate it. So real quick, when they do that, of course, that's going to send asset prices through the roof, right? Sort of a bull maybe. rally. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but maybe, Certain not markets, the, I mean. maybe not the same asset prices. You know, maybe, yeah, you know, I, I don't know that we're going to resurrect the tech bubble, uh, but I can certainly see, uh, you know, certain stocks, uh, value oriented companies with real assets and real earnings, those prices could go up. I think you're going to see a big move up in emerging market stocks and commodities. So uh, you know, yep. gold, silver, mining stocks, energy, agriculture, industrial metals. I mean, a, a lot of assets are going to do very well in an inflationary time period. The, the types of stocks Definitely. that did well when everybody thought there was no inflation, when we just had artificially low interest rates, those type of stocks are not going to do well in this next phase of, of inflation. Uh, let's talk a little bit about gold. Uh, we see central banks positioning themselves for some sort of reset, to keep buying gold on massive scales. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Are they positioning themselves for some sort of reset of the monetary system? Well, it's hard to get into the heads of what they're positioning themselves for. Uh, but clearly, I think there are a number of reasons that central banks want to and are increasing the gold that they have in their reserves. Um, you know, all the paper currencies are at risk of, defla of depreciation. Everybody is printing too much money. Everybody has too much debt. 
And so I think if you're looking for a reserve asset for your fiat currency, it doesn't make sense to just hold on to somebody else's fiat currency, even if it's the dollar, especially considering that the fact that, that we're in worse shape than just about anybody as far as our fiscal house. So I think that there is uh, a realization that you need something to back up your currency, not just somebody else's you know, IOU. So gold is the, the, you know, the only alternative, especially to people who want to get out of the dollar, but then they're not you know, that excited about the euro or the yen. Well, you know, what do you do? Well, gold is clearly uh, better than any of those currencies, and it's better than the dollar. But I also think the United States has really uh, caused a lot of countries to reconsider the wisdom of holding dollars based on America's ability to flex its muscles uh, with sanctions and punish people that are countries that act in a, in a way that it doesn't approve of uh, by you know seizing their reserves or cutting them off of the Swiss system or whatever they're able to do. Look what they've done uh, to, to Russia. So I think a lot of countries just don't want to be in that predicament. And so I think they're forward looking and they're thinking, OK, well, we better divest ourselves of dollars so the United States doesn't have that kind of power over us in the future. And to the extent that a country is holding on to gold rather than dollars, that that takes away the United States's power uh, to you know try to punish them uh, by using the dollar as as an instrument of that punishment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good point. Well, moving into 2023 with all these monetary policies and shifts that are taking place and this entire reset, are you forecasting a depression, Great Depression 2.0, something like that, or something less mild? <clears throat> the economic period that we're going to go through in the United States is is, is going to be uh, in, in, in most cases, I think, for most people, worse than the Depression was of the 1930s. Um, I think we have a much bigger bubble than the one that the Fed inflated in the latter part of the 1920s. I mean, we had the stock market bubble because of the Fed, mm-hmm. and the bubble popped, but we had a depression because of the government, because of Hoover and Roosevelt and their interventionist policies uh, that got in the way of the free market correcting the mistakes that were created during that bubble. And we've had a much bigger bubble now. The, the Federal Reserve under uh, Greenspan and, and Bernanke and Yellen and Powell is far more reckless and irresponsible than it was, you know, uh, under, was it Benjamin Strong or whatever it was at the, the latter part of the, the 1920s. And, and, and so the mistakes that have been made are on, on a monumental scale greater than, than what they were in, in the 20s. And it's going to correct, take a much bigger economic contraction for the markets to you know, fix this. You know, we, we, we have to reallocate uh, assets, resources, investment, labor, capital. Uh, we've made so many mistakes uh, during this bubble. And, and normally, a, a bust is proportionate to the boom that makes it necessary. And we've had the biggest boom, and so we should have the biggest bust. But the other problem is that I know the government is not going to sit back and let the free market function. The government is going to intervene once again with more stimulus, which actually gets in the way of the market's ability to correct the mistakes. That's why we had a Great Depression, because government interfered and it took the market a lot longer to repair the damage then would have been the case if we didn't have, you know, Hoover and then the FDR's great, you know, the New Deal programs and all that. But, you know, the historians don't get that. They, they think that the, the, the depression or the crash was the default of capitalism and that government saved us, you know, with socialism. But that it's, mm-hmm. the, it's the opposite uh, that, of course, is true. But we didn't learn that lesson. And, and so based on what I believe the government's likely to do, during this next crisis. Yeah, it's going to be with us for a long time. And the ability of the government to try to sweep it under the rug with inflation is gone. I mean, they're not going to be able to do what they did after the 2008 financial crisis or even after the COVID pandemics uh, shut down. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because any money that Fed prints is going to go directly to consumer prices. It's not going to go to the NASDAQ. Uh, it's going to go uh, to the supermarket, right? not, not the stock market. And it's going to show up uh, you know, in uh, energy costs and, and things like that. And I think the dollar, the next time we try this, is, is just going to collapse. I, I don't think you're going to see a bunch of people buying the dollar again as a safe haven. I think the, the epicenter of the crisis is going to be the dollar and U.S. Treasuries. It's not going to be a mortgage crisis like we had or subprime in 08. It's actually going to be a sovereign debt crisis where it's the credit of the United States government that is at issue. So when you say the dollar will collapse and you foresee that happening during this next <clears throat> crash that takes place due to all the circumstances and everything going on, when you say the dollar collapse, um, how would that manifest in the real world? Well, you'd see the decline in foreign exchange markets. Okay. So you would need more dollars to buy, you know, other currencies. Sure. Uh, you would see it even more dramatically in terms of things like gold, silver prices. Uh, you need a lot more dollars to buy an ounce of gold. Interesting. Um, yeah. you'll, you'll see it, you know, in, in terms of other consumer goods, the purchasing power domestically of the dollar is going to go way down. People are going to need twice as many, three times as many, four times as many dollars to buy, you know, what they used to buy. Yeah. That's why so many Americans now have two and three jobs. They used to have yeah. one job, but they can't afford to, to live with one job anymore. So they, ha they need two or three. And, you know, I don't know how many jobs uh, one person can, can hold down at a time. I mean, at some point, you know, there's not enough hours in the day. But I do think you're going to see a lot of retired people coming out of retirement. And they're going to be taking jobs because their retirement income is not going to be sufficient to, you know, put food on the table and keep the lights on or the heat on. Uh, we may start to see young people finally, you know, dropping out of school, going to work because yeah. they're not going to be able to afford uh, a college if they, college. You know, they can't afford food. I mean, in my opinion, uh, Peter, this is this is pure corruption and evil even because they're intentionally wiping out an entire class of people. When you think about it from the perspective of, you know, government, their main concern is their own reelection. And so they're simply pursuing the policies that they think are most likely to win them the most votes in the next election. And that's never to tell the truth about how bad things are and how there's nothing government could do but, you know, step back and, and let the free market function and we just have to tough it up. That's not a, a campaign slogan, you know, suck it up. You know, it's, you know, the voter is looking for the politician that's promising help and help in the form of a check. Yes, we will give you money. And, and so that's what these guys are just thinking about is, you know, how can we give voters money so we, we get their vote? Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is voters don't realize that the money they're getting is less and less valuable because of all these programs. And eventually, no one's going to want government money because it's not going to buy anything. So it's not going to make a difference if the government sends you a stimulus check if there's nobody that wants the money. And so you can't buy anything with the stimulus check. So basically, well, if we keep going down this path, which we are, uh, a global currency reset is inevitable at some point. Is there any way we might start to see like, um, you know, if the dollar implodes on itself and nations start dumping dollars that we might see some sort of commodity backed monetary system running on blockchain technology? Possibly? Yeah, I mean, that's what I've been talking about. I mean, the free market has a excellent solution for this problem to the extent that governments allow it to happen. Uh, you know, governments seem to have a lot of, you know, uh, power. Mm -hmm. But, you know, governments didn't always create the money. You know, right. governments didn't invent money. Money was invented privately. Privately. And all sorts of commodities functioned as money early on. And of course, before money, it was barter. Uh, but before too long, the money that was most effective and and therefore became money uh you know for the greatest number of people was was gold i mean you know metal was obviously you know good for money because you could make make coins out of it uh, but gold was uh the best metal uh, to use as money and so gold was money although it wasn't the only uh metal that you was used as money because we used silver we used copper we used nickel it, you know it depends on 
what you were buying. I mean, certain things, you know, you know, you couldn't buy a loaf of bread with gold because, you know, you, you'd have just a little teeny bit of gold. You know, they couldn't make a coin that small. You might lose it. So if you wanted to buy bread, you used copper. You didn't use you didn't use gold. But if you wanted to buy a horse, yeah, you know, you you know, you you'd pay for that with, with gold. But using gold in transactions wasn't necessarily as convenient as using paper. And and so the invention of currency, which was a money substitute that was backed by real money. So you would leave your gold initially with a blocksmith, but then with a banker, you left your gold there and you know he gave you an IOU, a piece of paper, note currency, which you could circulate because it represented ownership of actual gold. And so that was a creation of the free market. Now, governments came along and they needed money. They had to pay their soldiers. Well, the soldiers needed gold because they wanted, they had to buy food and the, and the farmers wanted gold. So how did governments get gold? They, didn't, they weren't sitting on any gold mines. So they had to tax the people. They had to go and take some of their gold and then they could use it to pay the soldiers or whatever they needed. So the, the private sector created the money and then the government simply taxed us when, taxed us when, when they wanted it. But once we started using paper money and governments kind of got involved, initially the U.S. government acted as a, as a bank. The Federal Reserve was like a private bank. It held a bunch of gold and it issued uh, Federal Reserve notes that were backed by gold, just like, you know, the private sector did. But then the U.S. government defaulted on the promise to redeem its notes in real money. And we started, you know, using just government paper. Right. And but and then once the government realized, hey, wait a minute, now we create money. We don't have to tax people to get money. We just create it out of thin air. Well, now we could just spend money. We don't have to raise taxes. We just spend money and we can buy votes. We can give the people all kinds of stuff and we don't have to tax them to pay for it. And then we started running these massive deficits and we have all this inflation. That's why the dollar's lost so much value, about 98 percent of its purchasing power since we uh, you know, really went off the gold standard initially gold standard. Uh, with, with, with Roosevelt in 1932. But, you know, the, the, the pace of dollar depreciation accelerated uh, in the early 70s after we, uh, we cut the last highs we had to the gold standard with, with mm -hmm. Nixon. But <clears throat> government money is no good. I mean, just like anything government provides, it's, it's, it's lousy. Government education is overpriced and the quality is low. Government health care is, is bad health care and it's expensive. Look, the post office is inefficient. It's, it's, it's a mess. You know, <laughs> FedEx is a lot better. <clears throat> Whatever the government gives you isn't, isn't going to be good. Well, as inflation really picks up, I think, you know, just like there was demand for a competitor to the post office or you know, Uber came around to compete with taxi cabs. Mm -hmm. Why were taxi cabs so expensive? Because government was running them and, and setting prices and, and, and things like that. It, there was no free market. In, in most cities, uh, it was a government created monopoly or, you know, duopoly. Yeah. But there was obviously a window there for a, a, a free market alternative. Well, the same window is open in a monetary system. And so what I think is going to happen is the private sector is going to start reintroducing gold into the economy using the blockchain, using the Internet, because it's so much more efficient than when we were just limited to paper currency. Right. Because sure. people mm -hmm. use dollars and euros or yen yes. because it's more convenient than using gold. Gold is a better store of value than any of those currencies. Mm -hmm. It's not as good a medium of exchange as fiat currency. But right. when you take a bar of gold and tokenize it mm -hmm. and issue a token that represents uh, the ownership of that gold, where the token is divisible down to a fraction of a gram. Right. And so now I can carry around all my gold on my smartphone. And to the extent that I want to buy something <laughs> with it, you know, it, it's as easy as spending dollars or euros in fact easier using the blockchain uh, it would be like bitcoin except faster and cheaper and the, the advantage that i would have over bitcoin is i have real money 
I mean, if I'm transferring you some gold, I'm transferring you something of actual value. And gold is stable. I mean, so if you if you sell me your goods or services and I pay you in gold, you know, you, you've got something of value in exchange for what you gave me. And you don't have to worry about going to bed and waking up the next night and it's 10%, 20% lower or it's worthless or whatever, because you know that gold is stable. And you also know that, you know, somebody else wants gold. You know, whether it's, you know, your landlord who's, who's now wants his rent in gold or the grocer who's selling, uh, you know, food for gold, whatever it is. But once we reintroduce real money in a, in a way that's convenient and easy to use, then everybody will reject government money. Government money is inefficient and, you know, it just loses value over time. You want money that is stable in value, that, 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 that preserves value. So I think you're going to see uh, private sectors in introducing money. And I, and I also think, you know, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, as they collapse and, and, and people see the difference between, you know, real gold and fool's gold and recognize that there was certain aspects of cryptocurrency that were good, but it only works if you pair them with something real like gold. So if you take a blockchain and put it on top of gold, then you improve gold. Gold then becomes more divisible, more portable, uh, a better medium of exchange than it was in the past. Even though it worked well in the past, it could work better in the future. So you don't need to abandon gold and say, oh, well, because I, you know, I can't send my gold you know, electronically to Australia, we should use Bitcoin. I don't have to send the physical gold. I can send my ownership of that gold to Australia because the person who's getting my gold doesn't want my gold. He wants what he could buy with the gold. But the, the key is somebody wants that gold because there's a jeweler who needs it. There is a, a, a semiconductor manufacturer who needs it. Yes. There is a dentist who needs it. There's an aerospace company that needs the gold. Gold is a real commodity and that's what gives it value. And the fact that it will always be needed means it will always have value. Um, but if I'm gonna use it as money, that means I don't actually need to use the gold. And so I don't need the physical gold. All I need is proof that I own it. Right. And if I have that digitally with a blockchain, then I could use my gold to pay for my groceries, to pay for my rent. Uh, and of course my landlord could collect his rent in gold. So all of this can work uh, very efficiently. And I think more and more people will be moving in that direction as uh, inflation picks up and more people look for alternatives to traditional fiat currencies and also to uh, these new uh, uh, fiat cryptocurrencies. Right. So fintech technology, I mean, digitizing okay. commodities really could be some sort of reset for the monetary system. If the people demand to be paid in real money, and more and more stores and merchants refuse to accept dollars or euro and demand to be paid in gold, well, then eventually the governments are going to have to move in that direction. The, you know, and the governments are going to have to go back to honest taxation because we need to take the power of money creation away from government. Government should not be empowered to create money out of thin air. Mm -hmm. Money needs to be a commodity. And if the government wants it, it needs to find a way of procuring it honestly, right? So it has to provide a service that it can charge us for. Like if the government wants to uh, build a subway system and it wants to charge me some gold to ride on their subways, if it's a good deal and they earn the gold, then they can get it. But of course, they also have the power of taxation. So if they want to provide a police force or if they want to provide a fire department, whatever else they want, and they need money, well, they have to tax me. They have to actually raise my taxes and collect that money honestly. They can't just create it out of thin air uh, with a printing press. If there was a digital asset that was fast, three to five seconds as a bridge currency or bridge neutral bridge digital asset, um, lowers the cost of moving money, um, something that's scalable, um, real-time settlement, three to five seconds, like I just said, and uh, energy efficient, something like that, that was pegged or backed by gold or some sort of commodity. Do you think that would have value? Yeah, look, when you take gold bullion and you, 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 you turn it into a coin. Based right? on utility. Right, you add value to the gold. 
Right? When, when the Canadian mint makes a, a maple leaf and there's an ounce of gold in a one ounce maple leaf, that coin is going to trade at a premium to the value of the gold as if it was just, you know, in a nugget. And the reason for that is that if I hold a one ounce Canadian maple leaf in my hand, I know that I've got an ounce of gold. I trust the Canadian mint that that coin is made of gold. And I can look at the coin, I can see uh, the mill marks on the edges, and I know, okay, you know, it hasn't been shaved, you know, it's a full ounce, and I trust it. And so might somebody else who I would uh, barter to. If somebody wanted my gold and I, I handed them a, a one ounce Canadian maple leaf, they know, okay, yeah, that's an ounce of gold. If I just said, here's a rock with some gold in it, why don't you weigh it? You know, it, it's, or if I even had a coin by a mint that nobody ever heard of, it's like, what the hell's that? How do I know what that is? So yes, there's some value there. And, and do so, I think that if you so, have a reliable company effectively minting a digital token, and saying, hey, this token is backed 100% by gold in this vault, and here's where it's stored, and, and it's independently audited, and it's insured, uh, so you have confidence that the gold is actually there. And in fact, if you ever want the gold, you can take delivery. You just might have to pay a fee to get it shipped to you, and depending on you know what type of coin or bar you want, you're going to have to pay for the physical cost of of taking this big bar and making smaller denomination coins or bars out of it, then yeah, I think that that has value beyond just the value of the gold. In a, a global economy where a lot of transactions happen uh, online and where people are increasingly transacting with people that are great distances apart, many, in fact, in many cases, they're different countries, not just different cities or different states, different countries with different uh, currencies, different languages. We all speak the same language when it comes to gold. Gold is universal. Uh, everybody can look at gold and know what it is and, and, and know its price in a local currency. So I think to the extent that we can reintroduce gold through uh, a blockchain, uh, that yes, it will make the global economy more efficient. Uh, it will make trade more efficient, and therefore it will will add a lot of value. I don't think that there's, you know, you're not going to get rich owning these tokens. Uh, you just won't go broke like you will owning dollars if if you just hold on to those or, yeah. or other fiat currencies. The most likely metal to use would be gold, for the same reason that gold's always been used as money. I mean, you it's you know you you could use other metals. It's just that your storage costs are going to be higher. Uh, than, than they would be with gold. And they may be more inherently volatile depending on uh, their, their use cases in industry. It's just that you know the way gold is used and it is so valuable and its properties are so unique that it's only used for uh, the highest uh, you know, use case. I mean, if you can substitute copper for gold, you will. But if yeah. in the circumstances where copper won't do it, where you have to use gold, well, then you have to use gold. But you don't usually need a lot of it and, and so its price is not ultimately going to be as volatile as some of these other commodities that you could use uh, as, a, you know, as the backing for a token. Uh, but I don't think it would work as well as money, as a unit of account, uh, as gold does. Look at Africa, you know, all the countries there where people don't have banking and don't have a stable currency to utilize. Yeah. <laughs> think about all the remittances that people from wealthier countries uh, send back to relatives in, in poor countries, whether it's in Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, uh, how, in, how inefficient it is to, you know, try to send currency, you know, via, uh, you know, Western Union or wherever they do it and, and yes. how high the fees are. Uh, all of these uh, communities would be much better served with uh, a gold-backed digital currency that they could easily store uh, in a, a smartphone, or even if they don't have a smartphone, they can load it up, preload it onto a debit card. Uh, you know, they can have all sorts of ways to be paid and to pay uh, uh, for goods and services, either the, the services they provide or the goods and services that they need. They don't need a bank account. 
Uh, they, they, you know, they just need, you know, access to a card or a, a smartphone. So long as governments don't just build barriers to prevent that because they claim, well, we can't allow that because, you know, some terrorists might get, get, get their hands on one of those cards or, you know, there may be some, some, uh, drug dealers, right. Or money launderers. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's always how they, they stop, uh, the financial innovations and, and, and progress is by is by claiming that you know we're you know some criminal might be able to use it and, and why that's while that's true uh criminals can use it so can honest people you know and just because a criminal can do something doesn't mean we have to make it illegal for everybody else to do it generally the government steal a lot more from us than all the criminals combined by trying to protect us from the criminals so if that's they just true. allowed us to transact yes a little bit would be stolen but not nearly as much as the government steals and we would all be better off now, there is a digital asset that is used as a financial instrument of value. There's a limited amount. Now, the ability what this has to do is act as facilitating liquidity. It facilitates liquidity from point A to B, bypassing intermediaries and middlemen. It moves value at three to five seconds. It moves it costly at fractions of a penny, and it's scalable. So it could just keep growing and expanding and taking on more transactions and volume. And this digital asset is actually called XRP. Ripple is the company. XRP, oh, yeah. XRP, is, XRP the, is the token, yeah. Is the token which facilitates liquidity. What's interesting is Ripple is rubbing shoulders with all the elite organizations and financial institutions in the world and the World Bank Group based out of Washington, had a document that was published. They had a stable coin section and they spoke specifically in detail of the use case and utility as a financial instrument for XRP. And then they talked about XLM, another digital asset for a different use case, a different market. So it's extremely interesting that all this happening in the world while Ripple is strategically positioning themselves with the financial institutions because the value is in the protocol and the liquidity solutions that XRP will provide as a financial instrument. You know, uh, digital currencies that are backed by gold circulating around, whether any of them would benefit from uh, moving along uh, the, the Ripple blockchain or whether or not Ripple has uh, something to offer that would speed up the processes or, or reduce the cost to the extent that that Ripple did have something to add that you know other other uh, blockchains didn't, uh, then there might be some demand for Ripple up to a point. I mean, I don't know you know what that point is or what price to assign to Ripple. When I, I suppose if I have one type of token and you have another, and we're not uh, in a similar ecosystem and we're trying to use third parties or uh, you know go through an exchange and trade, and may maybe maybe there'd be a use case, I don't know if that would be there. But ultimately, the token has to have value based on the asset that's backing it up, not just based on hope and prayer that you think the utility, it has value. Utility as well and use case. Right. Well, the, the question a problem. is though, right, if, if you just have a token that has utility, you have to measure that utility by the value that it's able to bring me. So if, for example, I can put my gold token on uh, Ripple, yeah. and that increases the functionality of my token, it makes it easier for me to uh, spend it or to earn it because it lowers the transaction costs the time. and it increases the, fee the speed, then yes, there's a value there. How much? It's hard to say. Um, but yes, you know, and you well, can measure. That's what XRP is doing. It's acting as a neutral bridge currency to move value, kind of how we send pictures and emails through the internet, moving information. Yeah, I, I know that. Focused I don't know on where, moving where, value. Where XRP is stands now on, you know, because isn't isn't that one of the tokens that uh, the SEC said was a security? And I know it's been wrapped up in litigation. That's they did that with Uber when they were disrupting the taxi business they did it with uh tesla when they were disrupt disrupting oil and cars and same thing with the internet you, you know how the sec is peter any any uh innovation or technology uh, disrupting a sector they'll come after you they try to regulate it 
then they control it and then they adapt it. Mm -hmm. So they're disrupting the financial system on the back end uh, based on our research. So, um, yeah, we, we wanted to get your opinion on that because um, yeah, that's what's well, I don't know enough about the functionality of Ripple to know whether oh, okay. or not it ultimately is going to add some value to uh, these type of transactions and then how much value it would add and therefore what would a, a token be worth. Hmm. Uh, and of course, a lot of it depends on the supply, the future supply of Ripple. And how many ripple do you actually need or a fraction of a ripple to uh to affect a transaction so i you know there's a lot there it's also uh, it's very interesting we see the bank of international settlements moving gold from a tier three asset class to a tier one and there are talks about uh re-evaluation of the gold price precious metals markets uh are you aware of this yeah well i know in banking and and it certainly makes sense that gold is a tier one asset. I mean, it's probably the safest asset that a bank can hold, uh, especially now. And in fact, if you look at the performance of gold this year, I mean, gold has hit record highs in most currencies against the dollar, but it's not down nearly as much as other assets. Sure. So, uh, you know, banks that hold gold have, have, have held up a lot better than banks that hold held just about anything else. Mm. And, and I think next year, gold is going to go up against the dollar as well. And I think it will continue to rise against other currencies as other assets fall, particularly bonds. You know, a lot of these central banks own government bonds. I mean, those things have been decimated. I mean, even if the dollar hasn't gone down, treasuries have gone way down. So if you have a portfolio of U.S. treasuries, you've lost a lot more uh, than a portfolio of gold. So do you think we could go back to a gold standard? But yeah, but the government, see, the government is going to resist it. I explained earlier that it's the government that yeah. is the enemy of a gold standard. I mean, the, because the gold standard <laughs> protects true. people from government. It protects yes. people from government profligacy. It requires politicians to be honest. Politicians don't want to be honest. They want to get elected and they get elected by lying. And so gold <laughs> is in their way. It stands, uh, you know, as a barrier, uh, you know, and, and so the government wants to dismantle that barrier. But as private citizens, we should want to resurrect it if we want our liberty back our freedom and our prosperity then we want gold to protect us from government there is no historical precedent for a fiat currency surviving i mean we didn't invent fiat currency in america right it, it, it's been around for hundreds of years and it's always failed there's never an example you can't go back 100 years ago 150 years ago 200 years ago and say here's a fiat currency and you could still buy something with it they're all worthless now, the, the only difference between the fiat currencies we have now and the fiat currencies we had 100 years ago, 200 years ago, you know, 300 years ago, is that the whole world is using fiat currency at the same time. See, normally it was like one country would, would do it and then it would collapse, right? Because the other countries are smart enough not to do it. But sure. now they're all dumb enough to do it. We got the whole world. I think the last holdout was like Switzerland <laughs> and they, they eventually got rid of their gold. Uh, but we got the whole world, uh, you know, in this doomed experiment that has that has failed every time it's it's been run, mm. and, and so this one is going to end in failure. It's just that because it involves so many countries, it's gone on for a longer period of time, and because it's gone on for so long, it's done so much damage, right. and so when we get the death of this fiat system, it's going to be very violent and uh, you know a lot more collateral damage than in the past when, you know, just one country's fiat currency went away and then that country went back to the gold standard like like everybody else. So you're going to have the whole world uh, that is going to have to go through this transition from a fiat system back to back to real money. OK, real quick, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin. Uh, again, we've been following you for a very long time. We know you're not a Bitcoin <laughs> fan. We aren't either. Um, people see it as a store of value. I think that's absolutely nuts. Yeah, well, the whole idea that Bitcoin is a store of value is just sheer nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can't store I agree. what you can't store what you don't have. The reason that gold is a store of value is because gold is a metal. It is a precious metal that doesn't corrode and um, has very unique properties. And if I have gold, 
and I bury it in the ground and you dig it up in a hundred years or a thousand years, that gold is exactly the way it was when it was buried. Nothing has changed. In fact, I can take my gold, I can melt it down, make jewelry out of it, and in a thousand years, they can melt down that bracelet or that necklace and they could get the same gold that was there originally. It, it wouldn't have been diminished at all uh, by the fact that it had been made into a, into, a, into a piece of jewelry. So it retains its properties. I mean, other commodities don't do that. They rot, they decay. Uh, you know, you can't hold on to them uh, for that long. So they don't store their value uh, for that length of period of time the way gold does. But Bitcoin doesn't start out with any value. It, it has a price. And that's where the Bitcoin people are confused. They, they don't know the difference between price and value. Because price is just what somebody is willing to pay. People, people can be dumb enough to pay uh, uh, anything at, you know, at a moment in time. But you can't store a price. And you know, especially when, when Bitcoin started you know, 11, 12 years ago for pennies of Bitcoin, and then it goes up to almost 70,000. To say I can buy it at 60,000 and say that it's a store of value, well, how are you going to store that $60,000 price when a few years ago it was under 10,000? I mean, anything that can go up that fast can come can down, down just as fast. fast. And, and therefore, by definition, it's not a store of value. It's a highly yeah. speculative asset. And of course, all these people who were buying Bitcoin at 60,000 were doing it because they thought it was going to a million. Right. And not yeah. like, you know, in a hundred years, but you know, in a few years is what they expected. Well, if you expect something to go up that much, that fast, you, how can it be a store of value? You, 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 it's, it's either a store of value or it's, a, it's something that can, that can go up 10x or 20x, but nothing that can go up that much is a store of anything. It is, you're, you are gambling on Bitcoin going up, but you have to recognize that anything that has the potential to go up has the potential to go way down. It's all pump and dump. And you have to remember the very exactly. nature, the nature of Bitcoin. I don't know if you've ever known anybody that was involved in any multi-level marketing or something like that, or, you know, but they're always trying to sell you on stuff because, you know, yeah, they, know. they want to build up their downline or whatever it is. Um, but all of the people who own Bitcoin, the only way they make money is if somebody other or they convince other people to buy, right? You need more people to buy Bitcoin. So once you own Bitcoin, you automatically become a prophet of Bitcoin. You're like out there trying to convert other people, the non-believers, <laughs> into your cult because that's new money that has to come in because that's the only way to get the price to go up because you don't use Bitcoin for anything uh, other than hold on, holding it and hoping that somebody else you know, comes in and, and, and pays a higher price. So it's, it's by its nature, you have to go out there and prophesize. That's why I said that, you know, the Bitcoiners are like the modern day Harry Krishners. And sometimes I think they're just trying to convince themselves. They have to keep reselling themselves. So they hodl and they, 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 they tune out all, all the FUD, right? And, you know, which is just, you know, FUD is like rational arguments that you have no response to. So you have to just dismiss it. As if, well oh, said. these people are just trying to scare us out of our precious uh, Bitcoin. But look, you know, Bitcoin is, as we're recording this, Bitcoin is south of 17,000. Right? It's yeah. on its way down from 70,000. It's down 75%, <laughs> right? It's lower than it was five years ago. People forget, five years ago, Bitcoin hit 20,000 in December of 2017. Yeah. Five years later, look at the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust which was at a 30% premium a couple of years ago. It's almost at a 50% discount. You can't give shares to the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust away. Nobody wants it. It is done. And go back and look at 2021. I've never seen anything like that as far as pump and dump, massive money spent. Every time you turn on the TV or the radio was one crypto commercial after another, Bitcoin. They bought all the anchors on all the financial channels. They paid off the celebrities, the athletes, the pop stars. They were naming stadiums. They were buying ads at the Super Bowl. They conned El Salvador into making it a, 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 a legal, legal tender. tender. They got Michael Saylor to lever up his balance sheet of his software company uh, to buy it. They, they conned poor Anthony Scaramucci into, into Skybridge and, and launching all these funds, which are all now down 80, 90, 95%. I mean, everybody that bought Bitcoin into the hype of 2021 
is it been killed. And we also gave birth to the NFTs, you know, to top it all off, you know, as if crypto wasn't <laughs> worthless enough. We had to come up with another worthless concept. And, and so all that came in there and massive hype. And now, you know, the, the air is coming out. And the question nobody seems to ask themselves, why didn't Bitcoin go up in 2021 with unprecedented advertising to cram it down everybody's throats? With all these institutions supposedly getting involved in Bitcoin, how is it that the price went down? And that's because all the people that were spending all this money to hype and advertise Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, they were selling it. It was yeah. pump and dump. So who owns it now? You know, a bunch of people that 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 that, that followed pop stars on Instagram. And they Michael Bitcoin. Saylor. Yeah. What what do they own it for? Are they are they libertarians that are looking to take down the Fed? No, they're, <laughs> they're people that wanted to get rich quick and they thought yep. crypto was the new thing. You know, crypto, crypto. I got to get in on crypto. And um, and so now they're going to be getting out of crypto because people are going to be selling it. Wait till you see next year. I mean, next year is going to be so much worse uh, because next year is when I think the margin calls come in for the average uh, uh, hodler. Uh, who's mm -hmm. been, uh, you know, living off of borrowed money for the last couple of years because they didn't want to sell their precious Bitcoin. They didn't want to pay the taxes and they didn't want to give up the upside when it went to the moon. So they were just uh, borrowing and they're probably going to start getting margin calls. I think when we're below 10,000 is where I think you'll start to see a lot of people having to put up more money and they're not going to have it. And so then they're just going to have to get their crypto sold. Mm -hmm. Well, who's going to buy? You know, I'm waiting yeah. for the margin calls yeah. on, uh, you know, MicroStrategy. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I think that that company is is going to go out of business. I think ultimately, um, you know, whether the creditors want to operate the software company or not, who knows? Uh, I think there's a, a, a collapse coming with the Gray Grayscale Trust. I mean, it's not trading at a 50 percent discount, you know, by accident. I mean, obviously, there's a problem there. Uh, and there mm -hmm. could be a financial problem brewing at Grayscale, which may ultimately result in the liquidation of that trust, which means all the Bitcoin that they have have to be sold into the market. Uh, who's going to buy them? Right. Um, you know, there could be a collapse coming uh, next year in uh, Tether. And one thing we know, we're going to get massive regulation coming from Washington because yep. of FTX. I mean, that's the crazy thing. We just had FTX blow up and everybody is just as bullish. All these diehard hodlers, they still can't, you know, see what's going on. I mean, look at Coinbase is at a new 52 week low today as we're speaking, down another six or 7%. I mean, it's down well over 80% since it did its direct listing a year and a half ago. It's IPO. But it's not even benefiting from wiping out its competitors. Even though it's all regulated, it's still collapsing because the whole business model is gone. I mean, it's all based on people trading cryptocurrencies. Well, they're not going to trade them when they don't have any value. Right. No one's going to want them. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's part of the malinvestment that we've had is the entire crypto and blockchain industry has been malinvestment. All of these companies that have been started over the last couple of years are going to fold. They're going to go out of business. Mm -hmm. Any money they borrowed isn't going to get repaid and all the workers they've hired are going to be unemployed. You no, know, another thing is you mentioned margin calls. That's an interesting key point because, you know, also we're going to start to see massive layoffs going into 2023 because of the financial crisis where these companies right. are going to have to file for bankruptcy. You know, is that something you're still uh, forecasting? Yeah, you know, because a lot of these companies never generated a profit but they still had a lot of workers. Well, how did they pay them? Well, they sold stock for to investors and they used that money to pay their workers. Plus a lot of the workers were willing to work for stock, right? They wanted the stock in the companies because the stock was gonna go up and so they were gonna make a lot of money. Well, when the stocks blow up and all their option packages are way underwater and the companies don't even have the money to keep the payroll because they're losing money, they have no, cash flow to pay the workers and they can't sell more stock because you know investors don't want to buy the stocks anymore because they're not the companies aren't profitable companies are going to have to downsize they're going to have to reduce their burn so they're going to uh 
you know, get rid of uh, workers. And, you know, this is going to be particularly problematic in the crypto space because I bet that most of the people who work for crypto companies, blockchain companies, they're not there just because, oh, you know, I just happened to get this job. They were into crypto and they sought out those opportunities because they were believers in the crypto future. And so they probably own Bitcoin, or Ethereum, or whatever other shit coins are out there. Definitely. That's where their savings are. That's their, their portfolio is, is, is crypto. So they're going to lose their jobs at a, at a blockchain company. And now, how are they going to make ends meet? Well, what do they have to sell? What's in their rainy day fund? Crypto. <laughs> so a lot of these people are going to be selling. Who's buying? Nobody. Nobody's left to buy. I mean, I would imagine that anybody dumb enough to have bought Bitcoin already owns it. I mean, who hasn't heard of it by now? And if you heard of it and you made a decision not to buy it, why would you buy it now? I mean, if you didn't buy it a year ago or two years ago, you're like, thank God I avoided that mistake. That's one mistake I didn't make. I dodged that bullet, right? Everything that I was told a year ago was BS because you guys told me when Bitcoin was 60,000, that it was going to 500,000, that it was going for, to a million, and I was a fool if I didn't buy it. Well, now it's at 10,000. So it, you said that could never happen. Why am I going to listen to you? Now, all they can do is say, well, if you'd have bought it 10 years ago, you'd be ahead. Yeah, but you didn't <laughs> tell me to buy it 10 years ago. You told me to buy it last year. <laughs> didn't right. Michael Saylor say, sell your house yeah. and buy yes, Bitcoin? He, <laughs> well, no, he didn't say sell your house. He okay. said mortgage your house mortgage to buy Bitcoin. Your house. Okay. So if you followed his advice, now you have to sell your house because you can't afford to live there anymore <laughs> or the bank is going to foreclose on your house. If people then, do their due diligence into understanding where this value is in the digital asset space, it's really the protocols. If they did their due diligence, they wouldn't be in the mess that they're going to be in very soon. I know. Well, that's why people constantly say, Peter, if you only did some more research on Bitcoin, you, you would be some, uh, behind it. No, I did the research and that's why I oppose it. And it doesn't actually require a lot of research. But, you know, a lot of people have to ask themselves this. A lot of you Bitcoin guys were singing the praises a few months ago of your patron saint, you know, uh, Sam Bankman Freed. He was like the Pied Piper. He was the JP Morgan of our day. He was the richest man in crypto, and the whole thing was a fraud. Everybody <laughs> fell for a con. Well, <laughs> if everybody was wrong about Sam Bankman Freed and FTX, maybe they're wrong about the whole thing. You know, maybe it's not just this one fraud, right? That's maybe the whole thing is fraud. Maybe you're wrong about Bitcoin too, right? Because it's the same people that 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 liked it. Hey, this guy is great. This guy is a genius. This, you know. And he was just either, he was either a criminal, completely incompetent, or maybe a little of both. But that doesn't say a lot. That doesn't engender a lot of confidence in the judgment of the crypto industry. That they didn't, they didn't ferret this guy out until after the whole thing collapsed. And then, and then they were, oh my God, how could this have happened? It, it should be much lower than that. Yeah, I don't know what's holding it up, you know, other than- I do, you know, actually. What? <laughs> um, so we did some research and some due diligence. And um, anyway, we discovered, uh, first of all, there's a company named Bitwise. Okay. And they put out this study that they did. So approximately $6 billion of Bitcoin trading volume around the globe. Uh, most of it is actually being done on exchanges that you've never heard of. Not Coinbase, not Uphold exchanges you never heard of and about 60 to 70 percent of that trading volume on the exchanges you never heard of are equal amounts of buys and per uh, buy and sells buy and sells equal amounts of odd figures back and forth so ultimately the conclusion we came to is that there's some sort of um a wash trading or some fraud going on to give the illusion that bitcoin has some trading volume and activity and the reality is less than about 40 to 30 percent is real trading volume from you know the 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 dumb person who's buying bitcoin and selling it back and forth yeah a lot of the volume then is really yeah. dried up what you're saying but yes, it also means exactly. that a lot of the people that are in bitcoin haven't got out yet 
they're just, you know, because there's no, these, if these transactions are all phony, no money is actually entering or leaving the space. It's just, you know, and also that's why some of these exchanges like Coinbase are seeing their earnings collapse because it's not real trading taking place on their exactly. platform. It's phony trading uh, that, that's taking place someplace else. But where you're going to see the next leg down is when you, you, the people who are holding and hoping either give up hope or just decide they need to sell for whatever reason. They need some money and they've got to get out. Maybe not even all of their Bitcoin, but they want to sell 10% or 20%. And, you know, all it takes is one sat. You know, you could sell, I mean, and that sets the price for all the, all the Bitcoin is where the last sat trades. Yeah. You know, and so a hundred millionth of a Bitcoin could trade and it could trade, you know, 10% lower. And then the, all these Bitcoin are marked down, right? It's just, that's all it takes, you know, is, is one Satoshi to trade and that's the new market. <laughs> well, if Tether collapses, then that just, completely destroys Bitcoin because I don't know what the percentage is. 80, 90% of all the Bitcoin transactions are, are settled in Tether. And so when you sell your Bitcoin, you're not even getting dollars, you're getting Tether. Now, everybody says, well, Tether, dollar, same thing. Well, maybe, maybe not. But what happens if nobody wants Tether anymore? What's the real price of Bitcoin? I mean, I thought that one of the reasons that the Grayscale Trust may be trading at a 50% discount to Bitcoin is because you can't buy the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust with Tether. That trades in dollars. So maybe that's the price of Bitcoin. Maybe Bitcoin isn't 17,000, it's 8,000 or whatever, you know, half of 17,000, because that's all you can get for Bitcoin, you know, or that's how much Bitcoin you get with real dollars. But if you want to pay with fake dollars, you know, you could, you could buy more, but we'll see. Uh, but I, I, I don't trust that Tether is 100% back. I mean, what I would do if I, let's assume that Tether was 100% legit. You would want to go out of your way to prove that you were legit. Right. You know, you would want to hire the best auditors out there. And if you've really got this much, uh, what is it said Tether is like 70, $80 billion that they claim to have. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty big. That's a lot of, that's a lot of cash. Apparently nobody trades with Tether. Like none of these uh, dealers like have them as a customer. Like that was one of the tells from Bernie Madoff, right? Nobody actually traded with Madoff. You know, he had all, he was managing all this money, but he, he, he wasn't trading with anybody because he, you know, it was all made up. The, the transactions were just imaginary. If, if you were Tether and everything was on the up and up and you knew there were some rumors, uh, you would want to, you know, put that fire out right away. Although Tether is not trading at a big discount. I mean, it's still pretty much one to one. So it's not like the market is, is doubting Tether. I mean, maybe if Tethers were trading hands at 90 cents, 85 cents, if there was a real haircut there, you know, maybe they would come forward. I don't know. I mean, say, okay, now we need to, to produce some audits to show you that, um, that, that we really have this backing. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, the price of Tether is still a dollar. I mean, you look at it, I mean, every once in a while, it gets like slightly below. Mm -hmm. But I mean, very slight. It's not like it goes way below, right? It doesn't go to 90 cents. I mean, it goes maybe 99 cents, right? It's still a red flag. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so the market doesn't seem to be, to be worried. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't know what they could be doing to manipulate that. But uh, you, you certainly find out that a lot of the banks and some of the banksters out there are behind a lot of these uh, Ponzi schemes. It's, it's, it's backed by next to no reserves and it's all based on government support and government guarantees and central bank backstops. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a, a sound financial system like the one that we had prior to the, the introduction to the FDIC in the 1930s. You know, yeah, we had some bank failures during the Great Depression, but less than 2% of all the money on deposit was lost in all the failures uh, in the depression, which is tiny if you compare it to, you know, what would be lost today in US banking. Let's say we didn't have any, any government bailouts and we had a depression. I mean, almost all the money on, at banks would be lost, not, not less than 2%. And, you know, we didn't have any inflation. In fact, we had falling prices during the 1930s. So if you look at the purchasing power of bank deposits, they actually went way up. So even if 2% of the deposits were lost, 
but the deposits that weren't lost, the 98% of the deposits that were fine, gained 30% of their purchasing power. Americans were much better off who had their money in the bank, mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact that a few banks failed. Well, but we were on the gold I, standard too. Yes, but I think next time when the banks collapse, there's going to be massive inflation that's going to be created to bail them out. And so the amount of money that's going to be lost in bank deposits is going to dwarf many times over what was lost during the 1930s. Right. Well, kind of like Cyprus. Remember when Cyprus had their financial collapse in 2013? He had the IMF step in, gave him a loan, mm -hmm. billions of dollars. Could we see yeah. the same thing happen? Well, the IMF isn't going to be able to bail out the U.S. That's the problem. I mean, we're too big. I mean, Cyprus was a little country. You know? And I remember, too, when that happened, there was some money that went into Bitcoin. It was a little bit of a catalyst to, uh, to, to move Bitcoin up early, early in the bubble. Uh, but you'll notice that you know, with all the sanctions on Russia and all this stuff, Bitcoin didn't go up. Bitcoin went down. <laughs> Whenever I, I try to get people to sell Bitcoin, in a way, I feel guilty because I know that if somebody sells, somebody had to buy. And so I'm not actually helping anybody. I'm hurting the person who buys the Bitcoin that somebody I convinced to sell gets rid of. It's just a transfer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> and, and, and all the money that people made in Bitcoin early on, well, that's gonna, it's, it's gonna equal the losses that everybody uh, gets stuck with who's left holding the bag. Because yeah. I, I point out all the time, no real value is created out of Bitcoin mining. No. We wasted a lot of resources. We wasted a lot of energy. Uh, we wasted a lot of intellectual uh, uh, power. Uh, a lot of time, a lot of money went into the creation of absolutely nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if the government wants to shut it down too before the tether collapse, before the Bitcoin collapse, the government can shut it down with uh, passing bans, um, yeah. shutting on the on and off ramps. If you shut that down. I yeah, mean, but if the government shuts it down, then the government's going to get blamed for it. The government, if they're smart, they'll just let it collapse all by itself. And then they'll come in after the fact and, and come up with new regulation. I, I don't think or, they want to kill it. They want to let it die on its own. Or they could blame it on a cyber attack and say Russia did it no. <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Peter, um, listen, man, thank you so much for joining us here today. I know it's past an hour or so. Yeah, well, thanks wanted for to having wrap me. it up. Um, and, and you know, in the meantime, anybody, if you're if you still got Bitcoin, sell. You know, if you were if you were lucky enough to get in years and years ago, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, and you've got gains, you know, leave the casino before you give up the gains. Uh, if you bought a few years ago and you're down 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, sell, cut your losses. You made a mistake, but don't go down to zero because you can make your money back. You know, there are other places that you can invest and that you can recoup those losses. You won't recoup those losses holding on to Bitcoin, right? You don't have to stay with the girl you, you, you brought to the dance, right? You, you can change partners when you realize that <laughs> the one that you, that you brought can't dance. Um, but, you know, get into gold, get into silver, get into stocks, real stocks. I mean, I'm, I'm managing portfolios for people of equities that I think have real potential. And if you want to speculate, I think there's a lot of these junior gold mining companies that can go up 10x, that can go up 20x. So even if you lost 80% of your money in crypto, right, you can actually make it back. You only need to get five times your money to get even if you lost 80%. So if you can get 10x in, a, in some gold stocks, you can actually double your money going back to the beginning, even though you've lost 80% of it. But if you stay with your crypto and you're down, you're going to go down another 80%. I mean, you're just never going to get your money back. Uh, so you still have enough money left over that you could do something with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I can help. You know, I, your Pacific Asset Management, uh, we manage portfolios for people in the types of investments that will do well in an inflationary time period. My mutual funds uh, are available on all the platforms. My value fund, my dividend fares fund, base, uh, bottom line, where both those funds year to date are positive on the year in a year where the NASDAQ is down 30, 35%, the S&P maybe close to 20%, uh, my value in dividend payer funds are positive. They, these funds, you know, my dividend payer fund ha is number one in its category year to date, that Morningstar tracks of over 350 international value, international funds. Uh, dividend payer, my value fund is in the top one or 2%, I think. Both those funds have five stars. 
year to date over the last two, three, and five years. In fact, my, my value fund is in the top 1% of 350 funds over the last three years and five years. And, uh, you know, I think this is because we're in the right place. We're in the sectors that everybody is rotating to. I'm in value. I'm in dividends. I'm in uh, uh, resources. Uh, I'm not in tech. I'm not in financials. I'm not in, you know, those type of companies. That, those are the bubble stocks and the air is coming out. And for several years, I underperformed. I wasn't always five stars. I had one star. You know, when everybody else was going up, I was going sideways. And so I was falling behind. Now I've caught up and, and, and now I've taken the lead uh, because I've been in the right stocks. And I, I think we're early in the rotation out of uh, growth to value. I think we're, we haven't even really started the rotation from U.S. to international. That's coming. And then mm -hmm. the next rotation is going to be from developed to emerging markets. And I'm positioned uh, there as well with my emerging market fund. And I think the biggest gains are going to be in gold. I, ha I have a, a, a gold fund that invests just in uh, gold and silver mining companies. And that fund is actually still down on the year. Um, it's having a nice day today, and it, it, who knows, it may end the year positive. We'll see how the last few days go. But most likely, the gains are going to come, I think, uh, 2023 and beyond. Uh, so, far, in fact, silver is positive on the year. Uh, yeah. Gold's down slightly, yes. but silver is actually uh, positive, and that's in U.S. dollars. So it's clearly up even more in terms of euros or yen or pounds or these other currencies. Uh, but, you know, there, there are some investment moves that you can make right now that I think are going to be extremely profitable. It's just that the mainstream brokerage firms are still oblivious to this reality. They're wedded in the past. In fact, they have no idea that we're in a bubble. And since they don't know we're in a bubble, they don't know that it's popped. And so they don't realize that they have to really do the opposite of everything they've done over the last uh, decade. It's very hard for people to make that kind of change. And, 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 and most don't. Here, this has been very pleasant and we are... Again, very grateful to have you on. Um, but we have to do this again sometime, you know? All right. A lot to talk about. All right. Well, we'll wait for Bitcoin to be below 10,000 or what are they, you know, or gold to be above, above uh, I don't know, 2,000 is probably too close, maybe for, I don't know, one or the other. I don't know what's going to happen. One or the first. other. 10,000 10, Bitcoin or 2,000 gold. 